Uh, welcome to the second lecture on parsing. Um, so uh, I'll start with a uh, well. It has come to my attention that I've that I've forgotten to uh, to tell you what my email is. I told a couple of you that if you have any uh, questions, uh, let me know. So now it's up there. Um, yeah. So a brief brief uh, re uh, recap from last time. Uh, we started with a uh, uh, well. We wanted to match some strings, uh, and we started with a reader monad, uh, but quickly realized that wasn't really enough. Uh, because uh, you know, if 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 we if we get a string in, it it can it can either match or not. Um, so we turn that into a maybe. Um, oh, uh, oh, sorry about that. Um, well, I'll show you here because I have it here. <laughs> um, right. So uh, then we realized that wasn't exactly enough either. Um, so we turned that into a state monad. Yeah. If I can figure it out, <laughs> uh, I mean I can also swap the colors here. But let me try something different here. Um, Better. Okay, only slightly. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. I'm not really sure how to how to do it. Okay. Sorry? Oh, okay. Is that if if I just to turn the whole auditorium down then <laughs> like that? Okay. <laughs> um right, so uh uh, apparently, I have a, a small error on my slides. But this is what we came down to this uh, this data type here. We have a we have a match parser, which is a which is a state monad, um, and uh, and it's wrapped in a maybe because uh, well uh, we can uh, we can either uh, 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 match the string or not. Um, right. So uh, there were a couple things I didn't uh, 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 sort of. Uh, First, there was some terminology that I used without explaining it. Um, I didn't really tell you what a parser combinator is, uh, so uh, that's rather simple. A uh, parser combinator uh, takes in uh, uh, perhaps, zero, uh, perhaps some parsers and produces a parser. Right? So the essential idea is that the, uh, the end result is some sort of a parser. Uh, and um, what we developed last time was a parser combinator library. Um, so uh, that was a library which contained a, a bunch of uh, functions which we could use to construct parsers. Um, there are some uh, other popular uh, uh, parser combinator libraries in Haskell, uh, uh, namely readp and, uh, and parsec. Um, so I'd uh, explain these as well. Uh, readp is, uh, uh, is, re is, is a rather simple library. It's a little bit more complete than what I'll end up presenting uh, by the end of this lecture. Um, and, it's, uh, and it's really, uh, well, it's rather well documented. Um, uh, well, yeah, I like it. Um, then there's Parsec, which uh, aims to be uh, an industrial strength uh, uh, parsing library, which uh, means that you have to be a little bit careful uh, about how you use it. Um, that is why, if you've sort of dug into the assignment, uh, you've noticed that we put some restrictions on what you can use from the Parsec uh, from, 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 from the Parsec library. Um, but uh, so I'll get into why, uh, 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 why you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, at least one of the reasons. Um, but for the assignment, um, you can either use uh, what I end up presenting here today, or uh, readp or parsec. Um, it's up to you, and 
Well, you should argue for your choice. Um, at least try this time, uh, but, uh, but, but especially when you come around to the exam, you should have a clear idea of what sort of, uh, what sort of parser combinator library you prefer. Do you prefer to write your own parser combinators, which can be, uh, which can be nice, uh, or do you prefer to use something standard uh, and uh, well documented? But again, that might mean that you might be using it the wrong way. Okay, um, so uh, the match parse uh, library that we uh, constructed last time, it had a couple, uh, uh, well, it, it had a, a, a couple parsers, um, or parser combinators, uh, get C and reject, most fundamentally. So get C would, uh, would, would, uh, would take a look at the input, take the character off, and um, uh, go one uh, character uh, forwards in input. Reject uh, would just uh, uh, fail, uh, uh, sort of return nothing. Um, and that was useful, um, for instance, when we try to implement something like char, where uh, we uh, pass in a character, and we would like to make sure that the next character on our input is that character. Right? So if it's not that, then we want to use, then we want to reject. Um, then we also constructed string, which was a uh, recursive alternative, well, which was sort of a, a recursive construction on top of char. Um, and chars, uh, which uh, sort of similarly, but uh, slightly differently, uh, accepted. So the next character could be one of the given characters, right? Uh, whereas a string is a string of characters that has to uh, has to be there. We also had wild, uh, which would just uh, pop off one character from the uh, from the input and uh, and continue. So it was a, like a wildcard operator. And we had an uh, end of line, and uh, I see that I had a similar uh, error with my slides here, uh, which would uh, ensure. So the type of <laughs> The type of end of line is the same as uh, uh, wild, uh, but that would uh, more uh, that would ensure that uh, that we had reached the end of the input. Then we also made match parser an instance of a type class alternative, and um, that gave us uh, some uh, some more interesting uh, parser uh, combinators. So these are actually start looking like something that reminds us of the word combinator. Right, so we, uh, we so we can take in two parsers, for instance, uh, and we can construct a parser which uh, either parses one or the other. Um, and, and once we did that for free, we got uh, these uh, these two other parser combinators, many and some, um, where uh, although you can't really see it from the type, the difference between those two is that many will parse uh, zero or more uh, occurrences of the given parser. Whereas some will demand that you have at least one occurrence of that parser. So let's move on and uh, and uh, add some uh, some more uh, sort of uh, interesting combinators uh, in there. Um, so the uh, the match parse library that I that I, that I published contained I think satisfy and option uh, maybe just satisfy, um, right? But uh, so satisfy. Uh, is a, uh, is a parser coming and takes in a function, um, and it looks at the character on the input, and uh, depending, well, and it uh, uses this function as a predicate um, to check uh, uh, whether, well, uh, whether that character uh, meets the predicate. And if it does, then it then the, then the parser succeeds. And the implementation is well, uh, as I explained it, right? If um, so we take in a predicate, and we take off a character. If the predicate meets the character, then we return the character, else we reject. And um, if you look at, say, readp or parsec, they won't have a parser combinator like chars that we constructed. Instead, they'd have satisfy, and they expect you to, to use satisfy to, uh, to construct something like chars. And that's because satisfy is a little bit more generic than our chars, right? So with, uh, with the chars uh, parser combinator, what we did there, um, I have it here. Uh, what we did there was that we took in a list of characters and we made sure that it was that C was an element of CS, right? So this is a type of predicate. So satisfy is just a generalization of that. Um, so it should be fairly clear how to do the exercise that I sort of hinted at there, uh, how to implement chars using satisfy. But um, won't do that now because more exciting things to talk about. Um, so option. Uh, is uh, is sort of like in terms of uh, 
sort of regular expression. In terms of regular expression, it's like the question mark, right? It's a, you, you, you either have a value or you don't. Uh, but in this case, you also have a default value, right? So um, you, you take in a value and you take in a parser, and you attempt to use that parser. And if that parser fails, you return the default value. Um, yep. So then we have choice. Um, Choice is, uh, uh, well, it takes in a list of parsers. Um, and uh, if, uh, um, and what it does is that it attempts uh, one of those uh, one at a time. So uh, this is uh, like a generalization of, the, uh, of this operator here, um, where uh, you know, I could pass in char A or char B or char C. Or I could write in choice, um, char A, char B, char C. Right. So it goes through the parsers and attempts them one at a time. Uh, and if one of them succeeds, then it, well, uh, then that's where we, uh, if one of, yeah. And if one of them succeeds, then, um, then we include that. Then there's between. Um, and that's a, a nice little thing if you want to uh, parse things that are, uh, say, in parentheses. So you want to match parentheses. Um, so there's a there's an open parser, there's a closed parser, um, and we first attempt open. Uh, we throw away whatever wh whatever that has uh, resulted in. That's why we use void. Um, then we go on to to uh, to do the actual parsing. So if this is like an expression within parentheses, we we would take an uh, expression parser there, um, and then we have a close. Again, we throw out the output and. Um, so, uh, and these two operators are a little bit funny, um, uh, uh, but what they essentially do is that uh, uh, when I use uh, this greater than greater than operator, uh, I uh, I throw away whatever the value, uh, whatever value this parser had um, had generated, um, and I use this value, and then I again throw away whatever is on this side. And use whatever the value came out of this, right? So that's why the parse, uh, the uh, the uh, the final type of the between combinator is again match parser A. So we're already moving a little bit beyond regular expressions because uh, you know matching uh, um, matching parentheses you might have heard is not exactly a uh, uh, a thing of regular languages, and this is where um, this idea of well you're not uh, uh, you know, we're we're not telling about Lex and Yak. We're we're actually giving you a, a something much more generic. So, a um, couple more examples of that uh, that are don't uh, have to do with matching parentheses is something like uh, um, uh, parsing a keyword. Right. Uh, so, a keyword um, or parsing a variable name in a programming language, uh, and typically uh, variable names cannot be um, keywords. Well those words that are keywords in the language. So if we have if then else in our language, uh, we, and we would like to make sure that we don't, uh, that the variable names that we, uh, that we parse uh, are not one of those keywords, um, it's, very, it's uh, fairly simple to do with, uh, with the tools that we already built up last time. Um, so uh, we're just parsing some chars, uh, right? And some will ensure that I have at least one of them. Uh, maybe this is not the best sort of variable name uh, convention, but uh, it's okay. Uh, and uh, I check if, uh, if if that sequence of characters is a, is an element of my keywords list, uh, and if it is, then I reject all such returns. Right. Now this is kind of hard. Well, uh, this is not really possible with regular expressions. Right. And we could do that easily. Um, so another example is uh, something like a user uh, uh, strings with with a user user defined length. So for example, if um, uh, so an example of such a string would be, uh, say, five hello, right? So the user types in how many characters this, uh, uh, the string has, uh, and then types in the actual characters of the string. Uh, and if we'd, like, if we'd like to parse that, um, then we can do this as follows. Um, so uh, first, we parse in a, a number, right? So the, f so the number perhaps starts with, uh, with a digit of, uh, you know, between, uh, between one and nine. Uh, and uh, then it can continue, uh, you know, zero more times with a zero or nine. Um, 
then uh, I have a sequence of characters, cn cons cns, uh, and if I would like to use that as a number, I need to convert it to one, right? Um, so uh, this is uh, this is one way of doing it. Uh, I could use the uh, uh, the fact that uh, integer has uh, an implementation of um, read uh, of the type class read, uh, and that has among other things a function read. Um, so uh, so when I read a uh, a string and I and I would like a number uh, or an integer, um, yeah, then Haskell attempts to do that, and if it fails. Um, it will yield me an error. And um, I commented here that you should uh, see my report. Uh, this is an example of, uh, of, of a nice thing to do in your, uh, in your, uh, in your assignment. When you, when you meet one of these things where you have to use a partial function, because read here is a partial function, um, then uh, you, know, you, sh you should argue why, well, why that still works. Now, the thing is here uh, that it doesn't actually work um, necessarily, right? Because uh, well, what if I type in way too many digits to fit in an int? What happens then? Um, and it's a bit fun to, uh, to try to figure that out. But I'll leave that as an exercise. Um, OK, so now I have an integer. Uh, and uh, to actually parse uh, you know, a sequence of characters between a and z, uh, n number of times, I'll need another parser combinator, which I have written down here, uh, which we could have included in our library, uh, but for instance, you know, read p comes with this uh, built-in. Um, so I didn't put it into simple parse, but it's somewhere on the side. Um, yeah, so that just goes on and looks at uh, sort of the integer that we get passed in. If it's a 0, then we reject. If it's a 1, then we try to parse. And if it works, then we just return the list. Um, uh, well, we, we, we just return a list containing that one value. Uh, otherwise, um, presumably, it's a uh, it's a not too big positive number, um, and we uh, so we just um, uh, you know attempt the parser once, and then we call count cursory with the n minus three. Okay, so that's uh, that's a bit of a recap from last time, um, and um, what. Uh, What I had talked about parsing being is something where, or well, a process by which we go from a string to an abstract syntax tree, right? But so far, we've only been talking about strings to strings, in a way. Um, now we could construct, you know, uh, chars, and we could construct ints as well, but they, they weren't really, you know, they weren't really very complicated data types. Um, so that's part two. Um, and uh, for that, uh, I'll introduce a uh, concept of context-free grammars. Uh, now again, just like we had regular expressions, context-free grammars are, uh, are you know, a tool that we'll use to specify um, some elements of our language, but that doesn't mean that they completely, completely specified either, right? Because sometimes we'd like to move beyond context-free things, and sometimes, well, context-free languages might be very uh, aware that they uh, have a lot of well, just the context free grammar has a lot of ambiguity in it, or could have a lot of ambiguity in it. So, what is a context free grammar? Um, so, uh, somewhat formally, it has four things, uh, right? It has there are some terminals, or so called terminals, some non terminals, and some rules, um, uh, and a starting symbol s, which is uh, among the terminals. Um, so rules look like this. Um, so uh, for each non-terminal, uh, well, uh, a, r a rule uh, has a non-terminal that it talks of, right? So in this case, this is a, uh, and then it has a number of productions. Um, here I, I call them f1 to fn. Um, these productions can be a sequence of either terminals or non-terminals. Um, I'll give you an example in just a bit. Um, a sequence that is empty, however, uh, we usually denote with an, with an epsilon. So uh, here's an example. Um, last week, we, uh, uh, there, there were a number of examples with the, this little uh, abstract syntax tree expert, or data type expert. Uh, and, um, ooh. Huh. 
that's a sneak peek into what's to come. Um, but let's say we had only a constant int uh, and uh, and an add, right? Um, then we could specify uh, a context-free grammar for uh, for uh, for strings uh, that would uh, transform into this data type uh, as follows. Uh, so I have an I have an expr, um, and uh, an expr is either a number or an expression plus an expression. Right. So that's what I mean by here is a non-terminal. Now here is also um, uh, a small non-terminal which I have for now chosen to leave unspecified. Um, then there's an non-terminal expr, um, a terminal plus, and a non-terminal expr. Now non-terminal means that, uh, well, uh, the, uh, when uh, when a parser um, is sort of working through the grammar, when it meets a non-terminal, it should recurse down uh, into this uh, in, in, into this non-terminal and uh, um, yeah, look at its definition and parse according to that definition. So, for instance, um, some uh, some example strings that I like to, uh, to to parse in this language are like two plus three or seven plus twenty-one plus fourteen uh, or the bottom one example there, right? Simple. Um, but this is uh, ambiguous. So one thing that's ambiguous is what the hell is num? Um, another thing that's ambiguous is, uh, well, how do I actually group expressions, right? Because I have, uh, I have only a binary value constructor add. Um, and if I have three values, 7, 21, and 14, how do I combine those using this binary operator? So for num, let's say it's defined by regular expression, and we know how to parse those, right? Um, so we can say it's, well, it's 1 to 9, and three uh, characters of 0 to 9. And I know that those fit in an int, for instance. Um, and uh, yeah, so here are some example numbers. So uh, Okay. Um, let me uh, let me hop in and uh, and write this language. Okay. So I have a uh, a file called plus ast. This is where um, uh, this is where I'll actually define my ast. And uh, well, let me remove that for now. Okay. So. Only constants or, uh, or on, on only a constant or an add. So uh, let's write a parser for this using our uh, match parse. And let's start with numbers. Okay, so. A number is uh, is one of uh, well, it matches this regular expression. Right. So uh, let me write something called pnum. Uh, this will be a parser for num, right? And uh, what it will do is uh, parse expressions. The way that it will do that is that it will uh, take one uh, character uh, being uh, uh, chars one to nine, right? and then I have a sequence of characters. Um, now I might actually want to use this count. Um, well, let's keep it simple. Let's say I wasn't too keen on uh, on this on this regular expression. Or yeah, okay, we can use it. We, we can we can use an if statement right uh, in uh, in just a bit. So let's say I just use many chars and I don't have this count combinator. Um, so many chars, zero to nine. Okay. Um, and uh, the way I'll ensure that it's not more than four characters is that I'll uh, first combine those two. Uh, into one string, and uh, if the length of uh, of this string is um, greater than four, uh, then I'll reject. 
right? And else I'll actually attempt to read it. So read s. Um, now read s uh, for now doesn't really know. Well, my expr is not an instance of the type class read, uh, so I don't know how to read those. And uh, what I'm really going for is that I would like this to be a constant, right? So something like that. Okay. Um, so let me just whip out a Haskell prompt here. Okay. So. Uh, I have to import match parse. Uh, guess it's not too happy about that. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so this is getting a bit long, so let me break it up like this. Uh, else return constant read s. Okay. okay. So um, let's try to parse it. Uh, so p num and so p num one two three. That gives me a constant. One two three four five. That gives me nothing because the string is too long. Okay, so that's a good start. Um, how about uh, letting my user be a little bit more frivolous, uh, right? So, uh, well, I haven't really gotten to plus yet, um, but uh, let's say that this is sort of the example in the assignment, uh, and it says that well, you know, you have to uh, you have to allow that the, uh, the user can type uh, all sorts of arbitrary white space uh, around. Uh, on tokens. Um, so what are tokens in this case, uh, right? So if we have uh, something called uh, s an expression like uh, 19 plus 23, then the tokens are 19 plus and 23. And what's in between that, we don't really care. It's, uh, well, uh, for this string, it's, uh, it, it, it can be sort of arbitrary white space. It could be line breaks, it could be tabs, it can be spaces. Um, so uh, how about we handle those before we sort of go on to plus? Uh, because uh, if I just sort of uh, type something like that, uh, it's not going to be too happy even though 1, 2, 3, 4 works. Um, so for that, um, we might add a, uh, a parser combinator to our match parse. Um, so here are those. Uh, okay. Um, so the first would be um, something uh, uh, so a uh, well, perhaps I just show you the final one, um, token. Okay, so I'd like to define a parse a, a, a parser combinator for uh, for uh, for such tokens, right? So a token is something uh, that can have some spaces around it, uh, but it's otherwise uh, well. Uh, d it depends on what you're parsing, right? So it could be a token plus, or it could be a token num, or it could be token something else, um, uh, Right. Uh, so uh, we'd like to define that as a parser combinator, and here it is. I take in a parser and I produce a parser, uh, and what I do I is that I prefix that uh, with a spaces parser. Right. So I start out with the spaces, I throw out those away, and I just do the p there. Uh, how space is defined? Well, let's just many space, um, and space is satisfied is space. So is space is a function in import uh, in uh, in data .char, uh, which uh, Matches well, not doesn't match, but uh, data dot char. So I just import this space from there. So is space is one of those predicates um, that will tell me a true for uh, you know space tab and new line, uh, but false for anything else. Okay. 
So uh, if I have a combinator like that, what I can do in my plus par in my plus parser is that I can well I have this pnum, but you know it's really a, it's really a token kind of thing. Um, so let's test that that works. So pnum one two three. Yeah, that works. Um, now I only uh, uh, put in the spaces before uh, before the parser, right? So uh, so I so I skip spaces and then I move on to uh, the, to the parser. I don't skip spaces after it. Uh, and uh, the thing is that that should be sufficient, right? Because uh, tokens uh, you can regard tokens as everything that is not related to to, uh, to white space. Uh, right, so your um, your program should really be a sequence of tokens separated by, well, maybe arbitrary or maybe at least one space. Right, so I could in in this case I have arbitrary white space, um, but I could have um, uh, a, a demand that well uh, I always have a space be before a number, for instance. Um, okay. So as long as you remember to use token in the right places, you shouldn't have to do any space handling manually. Right? But otherwise, of course, I could have done space handling manually, uh, but that has shown to be severely error prone to do that. So that's just a tip. So define a parser combinator like that uh, if you don't already have one. OK, so that's numbers. Now how about plus? Right. Let's get on to the fun stuff. So if I have uh, an exp uh, if I have a string like seven plus twenty one plus fourteen, uh, I have two ways, two possible ways I could re uh, put that down into my abstract syntax tree. Right. My abstract syntax tree only has an add, which is a uh, which is a, a binary uh, value constructor. And uh, so one way I could do it is that I could uh, group my uh, my pluses on the sort of towards the left, so I have seven plus twenty one, and then I add the fourteen. Right, so I add seven and I add twenty one. Compute the value of that, and then I uh, and then I add fourteen. Um, I could also do it in a right associative way, where I group uh, things towards the right. So in terms of my abstract syntax tree, that could be add. 21 and 14 first, and then add 7 on top of that. Right. So for plus uh, or this little language where I only have plus, uh, you know, you might be thinking that ah, well, why does it matter? Um, and uh, uh, well, if you uh, if 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 you remember what an int is, um, that's just a uh, a machine word size value in Haskell. Um, and uh, depending on uh, the order in which you uh, in which you add your uh, values, um, you know you might run overflow, uh, run into overflow or not. So it does kind of matter at runtime, but at parse time we definitely have to make a choice, right? We cannot construct an abstract syntax tree without making a choice, either right? going one way or the other. So how do we make that choice? Um, okay, so in general, um, if we have a, a left associative operator, say O. Uh, and uh, 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 right, so in my in terms of my in terms of my expr, um, then uh, I have an uh, have an expr an expr plus, and I have just uh, I have just one uh, production uh, up here. It's called a num, right? Um, and uh, so if I have a form like this, um, the way that I uh, would like to transform it is to is as follows that. Uh, uh, I introduce an e prime, and um, I uh, I want to sort of in a in a in a greedy fashion consume as big an e as possible first, and then parse an e prime, right? So if it's left associative, that means I want to consume as big an e as I can first, and then consume a num, right? So. Um, Uh, so what does that mean in terms of uh, if you're writing an actual uh, if, if if you're writing a parser for this using uh, sort of parsing and you're doing and you're doing this by hand? Uh, well, 
you have to construct a value before you recurse. Um, no, I mean after. Ah. <laughs> okay, swap before and after. <laughs> uh, well, okay. So right associative is the other way around. So I, I think I sort of missed, uh, messed up on these uh, in practice things. Uh, I'll show you an example in just a bit. So if it's a right associative operator, uh, we, uh, we, we, we do it sort of the other way around. It's, it's very simple to the left associative one. Um, except that uh, in in, in, instead of recursing uh, sort of on the left, then we recurse on the right. right. This is how we transform the grammar. Um, and uh, that grammar transformation uh, supposedly gives us a hint on how to implement uh, the actual operator. So uh, here they are. Um, both left associative and the right associative operators implemented manually um, with the match parse we have. Right. So uh, what, does, uh, what does this look like? So if I have an, uh, an L plus, uh, yeah, so for, th for, the, uh, for the left associative one, right? Uh, what I do is, um, yeah, okay. So for the left associative one, uh, um, uh, what I do is uh, I I, uh, uh, I look if there's a pnum, uh, and if there uh, and if there is a pnum, I parse into this uh, L plus double prime. So the reason I uh, uh, I do that first is because I really want to write this uh, L plus double uh, double double prime because I want to pass in an expression. Um, right. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, so I have already parsed the number, um, and then I, uh, when uh, when this number is passed down to the to, to, to the recursive pl uh, function uh, L plus double prime, um, that will attempt to uh, to parse a plus, uh, and if that works, then it will uh, attempt to parse another plus. Well, it will attempt to parse another number, and uh, here it will. Um, before it will recurse on itself, right? So this L plus double prime before it will recurse with the uh, with, with with the same value at e1 e2. Uh, yeah, it, it 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 will add e1 and e2 before it recursively calls itself, right? So I want to construct. So if it's left associative, uh, I want to construct the value first because I'm sort of prog uh, as I'm progressing through the input, I want to construct the values and I want to pass them on to the future parser, right? Um, for the right associative one, it's very similar, except that, so here on the left associative, uh, I am uh, just parsing a number, whereas here I'm doing a full recursive call on the uh, on the whole R plus. So that means that that will give me the remainder of they will parse the remainder of the expression and give me something big, right? And uh, and so I can uh, I can return and add e1 and e2. Now uh, there might not be anything on that side, right? So I might just have a number still. So that's why I return an e1. So uh, let's just see how that uh, pans out. And I think that what I'd like to do instead of uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. And uh, Copy L plus down here and R plus down here. Okay. So um, R plus. If I have, uh, let's say, 1 plus 2 plus 3, well, 1 plus 2 gives me an add con 1, con 2. L plus gives me the same. But if I add 3 with a left associative 1, then first I add 1 and 2, and then I add a 3. If I use R plus, then I... Uh, add 2 and 3 first, and then I add 1 on top of that. 
Now you might be a little bit confused that you know there's there, there's there's these parentheses. Couldn't I uh, couldn't I swap those around? Couldn't I say return e1 first and then or else uh, do this token thing uh, or do this plus thing? So uh, you might be tempted to write something like this instead. Um, and this is uh, where we meet the first limitation of match parsing, um, because uh, match parser goes on to parse things. Uh, you know, if uh, if there's a because of the way that maybe implements alternative. So um, yeah, <laughs> write the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I told you last time that uh, you know, maybe implements this alternative operator, and if I have nothing or nothing, then I get a nothing. It complains a little bit that it doesn't really know what type I'm going for. But you know, if I have a just A there, then it will give me a just A. Um, similarly, if I have a just A here, and then I just have a just, and I have nothing here. And give me a just a, but if I have a just a or just b, just gives me the a, and it doesn't really bother doing the rest. So if I um, do that transformation that I talked of, because I think that that's a little bit nicer, right? So we have return e one. Else I do there. Then I can reduce the indentation. You know that? I think that's nicer. Return D. And if I perform that transformation and I um, And I uh, try to do this again. It won't consume all of the input, neither for R plus or L plus, for that matter, right? Uh, and that's the thing that there are, uh, 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 you know, there's uh, there's a certain ambiguity in this uh, in this parser that I've that, I, that I've implemented, right? I haven't really told that I want to reach the end of the input. Um, and uh, so it parses a one, and then uh, uh, it says, "Well, I have a one, so you know I don't really need to do anything else." Okay, um, so if I try to uh, do something like, "Well, I have this end of line, so uh, can't we, uh, you know, uh, um, can we do that?" Well, you can, but then you get nothing, right? Um, and that's because it has chosen the path to produce the value 1. And when it reaches to the parser end of line, it doesn't have a history um, to fall back upon to try an alternative parse where it actually would, ex where it actually would go all the way to the end. Right. So it doesn't really go back and try again. Um, now, as a uh, right, so there is another type that also implements uh, alternative, which uh, has much better properties. Lists are also instances of alternative, and if I have empty list or empty list, it gives me an empty list. If I have a value in one of them, it will give me the value in one of them, or it will give me that value. But if I have a value in two of them, then I will merge those lists together. So presumably, if I take my match parse, and I call it simple parse, now I'll call it simple parse not because it's more simple than match parse, but because it's more simple than read p. 
And um, what I'll do is I'll, uh, well, I'll, I'll change the names a little bit, right? So I have a match parse, it's called simple parse. And I'll replace, replace match parser with, uh, ah, parser. OK. Uh, so after renaming, let's get to the actual MIDI things, right? Here it is. Instead of a maybe, I produce a list. Now, my instance of alternative doesn't need any changing, because what I do is I just parse PCS or parse PCS. As long as my parse produces a list, then I can use that property that it's an alternative and things w and now you know and I can be happy. So um, let's find that thing where parse is defined, right? Now right now parse returns me a maybe, but that will give me a type error anyway, because one parser has this type query. Um, I also have something called full parse, which I didn't really show you, uh, but that would actually ensure that I reach the end of the input. Um, So uh, instead of this, I could have done that. Okay. So. Um, okay. So how do I fix this? Uh, well, full parse uh, went on and say and 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 and, uh, and 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 ran the parser, and if it produced a value, it checked that the, there was nothing. Uh, uh, well, that that consumed all the input, and then it g gave me. Uh, um, you know that value. Uh, now, what can happen is that it can produce a whole bunch of uh, these pairs, right? It can produce a whole bunch of values and a whole bunch of remainders. Um, and let's say I don't, uh, uh, well, I'll use that property that I had shown you that if I have a p, then I can do something like this end of line, right? So I parse p and then I parse an end of line and I forward the value from p uh, afterwards. Um, Okay, so that parser will uh, will give me a uh, a list of uh, of a comma empty string, which is not really that useful. Um, so I can map first onto that, and that will give me just a list of a's, right? Okay. Uh, so that was all the maybes, but I also need to move all the justs and all the nothings. Okay, so return. That now just looks like that. Um, because I just have one value. Okay, how about next one? Uh, get. Uh, well, that just has one possible parse, right? It has just a string. Um, get C. Again, if I have a character, then uh, that's, the only, uh, that's the only output I can have. Now, if I have nothing, I actually want to fail. So how do I fail, I fail like that, I just return no parses. Um, similarly for the fail function up there. So I think uh, that was almost everything. So no no more nothing, no more just, and no more maybe. Okay, so uh, let's try to uh, load in that plus parser again. Uh, oh, there is one more thing that I need to do. So now I have a simple parse instead of match parse. And I'll use that here. And I want to replace all the match parser with parser. OK. So plus parser. And uh, let's try that now. So now it consumes all the input, which gives me just one value back. Um, it adds 1 and 2 first if this is a left associative uh, thing. And if I use R plus instead, then it adds two and three first, and adds one on the end. So well, with that, let's uh, take a break until 19 past. OK, let's um, continue. Uh, yeah, so it was uh, pointed out that uh, I um, that I went over a little bit too quickly. Um, no, I, I had a, uh, with, with the left associativity. Uh, and. Uh, well, I had a slightly different plan, but I suppose this is this is the better one. Uh, so uh, here's um, here's that slide again about left associativity, uh, right? So I have a uh, so I have an E uh, uh, non-terminal that has a, a a left associative operator down here and has a number of productions. And the way that I transform it is that I uh, keep sort of the uh, the left recursive part of E um, 
and then I define an E prime uh, where I put the uh, other productions down into, right? And I do that uh, uh, well like this. Right? So I put the operator after the uh, that question part. But if you actually try to sort of naively implement a parser for this, you might uh, uh, you know run into the well uh, obvious problem that uh, that uh, you have a uh, that you have a recursive definition. Uh, so how do you, uh, you know, how to fix that? Um, so uh, uh, here's uh, sort of the general way, um, and uh, uh, yeah. So if you have uh, an unterminal e which has some uh, number of uh, left recursive uh, productions, um, so here I have an e followed by some sort of sequence of terminals and non-terminals g1 uh, down to uh, e to gm, um, then, uh, and I have some non-left recursive. Uh, um, Productions. Uh, then I transform this as follows. Uh, I take the non-recursive uh, productions uh, down here and I put them, uh, uh, well, put them in the top. <laughs> you could, you could, you could, you could put, you would say it like that. Um, and um, the thing is that uh, these are sort of the basic building blocks uh, of uh, of E, right? So I want to parse those first, um, and then I I might optionally have some follow-up to that. Um, and that follow-up is, uh, is 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 what is defined in, in down in E prime, right? Um, so uh, down in E prime, I have well, what sort of follow-ups can I have? I can have a G1 to GM, right? And those again could have follow-ups again, right? So that's why I have E prime down here on the on, on the end as well. Um, now it could also be that I actually just have one of these productions and I have no follow-ups to that. Uh, that is why E prime also has the empty production down there. So what that means in practice is that I have to, uh, 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 you know, I have to parse these basic uh, uh, or these more basic uh, productions first, and then I have to pass that in as a value to the to to, to the parser. Right? So that's why uh, the L plus and R and R plus are so much alike, uh, but very subtly different down here, where there, there there's a difference of one plane, right? Um, uh, and and that's what um, makes the difference, really. Right. So we came down to this, uh, where we had a uh, 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 a parser that would give us uh, sort of um, uh, that could uh, a parser that could backtrack, uh, and uh, as a as a as a benefit as well, it would give us all the possible um, parses. Um, so um, uh, there is one more thing. Uh, with regards to uh, grammars that I'd like to uh, uh, discuss, and that's if we have uh, something a little bit more uh, complicated than a plus. Um, so um, let's uh, let's create in uh, just an uh, perhaps an expert AST, um, and that expert um, that will have. Uh, a multiplication operator as well, right? Um, now I uh, now the grammar for that would be uh, something like this: that I have uh, an expr and uh, that is either a num uh, or it is an expr plus expr or it is an expr times. So I could be given grammar like that, and um, so uh, this is uh, this is uh, so yeah. If you if 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 you think uh, back on uh, sort of the conventional rules of uh, rules of arithmetic, that multiplication should bind stronger than plus. Um, then I have sort of a, a an additional problem to the fact that well, this is first of all left recursive, and the associativity of of, of plus and times could be you know left associative, right associative. Right, so now I also have the problem of of of, uh, of precedence, um, and uh, that means that well, the, the the idea of precedence is that it overrides what would otherwise would have happened due to associativity, um, um, and uh, sort of in general, uh, here's uh, here's a solution uh, to, uh, to to this sort of uh, problem. Right, we 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 would like to transform the grammar to. Uh, um, to reflect these uh, these rules of associativity, or these rules of precedence. So let's say I have an uh, I have a some sort of a, 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 a an O plus, or, or an, uh, I have some sort of an O times. Let's call it that. 
and have an O plus. Um, and if I have that, if I'm told that O times uh, by inside of then O plus, um, and the grammar looks something like this, so again I have some productions at 1 to Fn, and I have some of those uh, left recursive ones, um, then uh, uh, if it is defined that um, uh, O times and O plus uh, are both uh, uh, left recursive, um, and that's something that I need to know, right? So for precedence, uh, for fixing precedence, I actually need to know whether it's uh, a left associative or a right associative. Now the operator could also be non-associative, um, uh, but I'll guess we'll leave that as an exercise. Um, okay, so uh, let's say that they're both left associative, and I use those. Uh, so sort of what, uh, what what I was the rules from essentially just a couple of minutes ago, um, uh, but in addition. Uh, I oops. Uh, this one should be called E prime. <laughs> so there should be a, a prime there and a prime there. Uh, right. Uh, so uh, I construct sort of a, a, a hierarchy of parsers. Right. So first I'd like to uh, parse some sort of uh, uh, plus and 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 then some sort of a, um, a times as well. Um, okay. Um, So uh, um, if we uh, if we try to do that, plus parser, plus parser. Now I have an L plus. Um, now let's say I'll. Uh, a little bit naive here, and uh, I'll take an L times. L times. Uh, right, so again, I use the same rules. Now, I could have defined a parser combinator for that, uh, but I think the time is a little bit too short. Um, so, in the handed out simple parse, there will be a, a, a nice parser combinator for chaining things in a left associative way. Um, so times, times, more. Whoops, thank you. Okay, and uh, okay, so this would have been sort of the naive way of doing it. And what I'm saying is that, uh, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, I'd like to multiply things, but it could also be that I would like to uh, um, to add um, uh, uh, yeah, to add things. And so, um, uh, what I'll use here is, in is instead of uh, pnum, which is sort of my my basic parser, my basic parser, that will really be my l plus. And also change the token. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, oh, right. S token. I didn't introduce that. Um, S token uh, is a uh, is a nice little uh, combinator that, that 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 takes in a string and ensures that I have that string uh, possibly preceded by white space, um, and uh, it returns to me a uh, a unit, um, right? So that I can type in a nice little thing like this. S token style. Um. Uh. So, let's. Uh. Okay. You can see I was doing some fun things here. Uh. Full parse. Um. Right. So, of course, I could go with L times, but maybe maybe it's time to actually define something that is that says more about what it is actually that it's parsing. Right. So P expert is really an L times there. Parse uh, p expr, and that would be um, sorry. So let's say I uh, have a one plus three times four. Uh, oh, yeah, that's because it's not a plus. Now it's an expert. 
Um, and X for there. Why is that not used? Oh. <laughs> um, that went okay. There's a couple of warnings. Uh, I'll come back to those. Um, yeah. So, uh, everything is left associative, right? So, if I say uh, uh, um, 1 plus 3 plus 4, I got an add add. Uh, now, if I perform a multiplication there, then it should fix that. Well, it not fix that, but sort of change the order of things, right? So, I'm multiplying 1 by the result of uh, adding 3 and 4. Oh. I've swapped those around, right? So now times is is bind. Uh, so, so now plus binds tighter than plus. Um, so really, this is what I want. Uh, L plus there enum and L times. Right. So I did something different than I proclaimed I was doing. Okay. Uh, so now really. This is what I want. Yes. Okay. So I have. Um, if I just type in a plus, uh, then I have an uh, uh, an addition of one and three, and then I add four onto that. But if I multiply, then the order of things change. The order of things changes, uh, and uh, I'm multiplying three and four and adding the constant one. Um, right. Now you know uh, the, the 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 whole process of me just copy pasting the code from L times to L plus and making these small errors along the way is error prone. So uh, there is there will be a parser combinator for this uh, called which we'll call chain L uh, for left and chain R for right, um, where we essentially encode this functionality. Um, okay, so let's move on to something else. Um, and uh, so these warnings that I got uh, a little bit earlier, that's because I was uh, going ahead and I wasn't, well, in the break, I went a little, a little ahead of myself and didn't do it quite well enough. So uh, if we, um, right, so my simple parse currently when I parse spaces, uh, I'm doing sort of like a, uh, a many thing. Right? Now a many thing uh, with lists, that will give me, that will sort of give me all the possible parses, right? So if I'm consuming a space, well, let's say that I have a whole bunch of spaces uh, before my token, right? Um, if I'm using many, uh, and I'm using the, uh, the list uh, alternative implementation, right? Uh, then it sort of parses a space, and then it says, well, maybe this is where we, maybe this is where we stop, right? Uh, um, and if you parse another space, then sort of the same thing happens, right? And we build up all uh, uh, a whole, you know, a really big sort of state um, where you don't really need that state uh, if you're talking about things like consuming spaces, right? Now, I want that choice between either I want to go left or you know I, I, either I want to uh, either I want to recurse into this non-terminal or not um, when I'm actually dealing with things much more interesting right so when I'm when, when I'm going from one token to the next but when we're talking about actual token parsing I don't really want that whole uh, you know, all that all, all that flexibility what I really want is to just um, you know as long as I see a space I just consume it uh, as long as I see a space I just consume it so there's no alternatives here um, uh, and uh, so this is a bit like the chars um, uh, example, but there's also a uh, a, um, a more generic uh, parser combinator um, which we call Munch, uh, which does uh, just sort of similarly to satisfy, but just does that a number of times, right? So as long as the char uh, as the character on the input uh, matches the predicate, it will consume that character. And it will not produce the alternatives, uh, which means that the state of my parser does not grow sort of enormously large, uh, making my parser uh, uh, slow if the user just puts in a whole bunch of white space. Right. So if your parser is slow, um, then you're probably not using much. You're probably using many. Um, now I couldn't come up with an example in the break, but um, 
what you do is do that instead. Um, now, munch could be useful in, in terms of other things as well. Uh, things like numbers uh, is also uh, where you don't really want the alternatives. So as long as you're not dealing with sort of crossing token boundaries, uh, you probably want to use munch. And uh, I think this is the part where uh, we will, uh, let me just make sure that everything works. Um, yeah, a couple of warnings, but it works. Um, this is where we'll uh, turn to uh, uh, um, the testing instead. So now, um, sort of the simple parse library uh, is sort of, um, well, it's it's got many of the features that you also find in readp. Um, and uh, and a couple more, so we hand out this token uh, thing, um, so you don't have to define it yourself. Um, yeah, so you can use that in the assignment if you want. Um, you can also use readp in both types. But we would also like you to do some testing um, of uh, both this assignment and uh, sort of when we get around to the to the exam. And um, uh, last time I briefly introduced this uh, Tasty library, um, and uh, if you're using Stack, which is what we recommend on the course webpage, then this is the way to go, um, right? Uh, so you want to install Tasty. You also want to install uh, a unit, sort of the unit testing sublibrary of that, and the quick check sublibrary of that. And uh, when you are implementing your tests, this is these are the first couple lines. Um, so you just import those libraries, um, and uh, yeah. So um, so let's write a test for our uh, expression expression language. So uh, maybe um, one thing that we could test is uh, you know I I I, I claimed that uh, sort of left associativity or right associativity doesn't really matter as long as we're dealing with uh, with these, um, with a simple uh, class language, right? So um, these are the old tests. So let's write some plus tests to start with. Um, now to write them, we will also need a uh, a uh, an, inter an, an interpreter for plus. So uh, let me write that. Plus interpreter. Okay. Um, import plus. And uh, right. So expr goes to int. An n, and eval at e1, e2 is just eval e1 plus eval e2. Okay, so let's just uh, see how that works. If I have a plus interpreter, oops, uh, it's called tasty. Um, Right, so eval plus conf five context uh, at second. Okay. So um, let's move on to plus tests. And uh, instead of imp Importing this, um, I'll uh, import my plus parser, and I'll import my plus AST, uh, and I'll import my plus expr. Right. So, um, and let's comment out this part here for now. So let's write some unit tests first. Okay. Um, So 
one thing I might want to test is that uh, uh, you know, 5 plus 6 is the same as 6 plus 5. Or something like that. Uh, I could uh, call in. Okay, uh, so I will need a couple things more for my parser. Um, well, okay, so if I, if, I, if I don't use my parser yet, uh, uh, oh, no, it's, that would be boring. Let's use our parser. Uh, my parser should also have, so it's going to export a couple things. And uh, what we will export is a parse string. And parse string, that will be just don't really have a p expert here, but um, yeah. So that takes in a string and produces an expert. Um, well, a list of experts. Right. Um, so I use uh, something from my simple parse library. Right. Uh, I take uh, take parse, and what I would like. So let's say I can. Uh, I'll use the L plus, so left associative plus, uh, and uh, I'll just use the S string for that. Oh, I might just do something like that. Okay. So let me just test that that makes sense. Um, Let me use full parse there. That was the uh, nice little. Yes. Okay. Okay. So now I can parse a string for my parser. Um, so in my plus tests, I can say something like, well, if I parse five plus six, right? That will give me a uh, a list of possible expressions. Um, now uh, I might be uh, tempted to uh, to say, well, I don't really, you know, I I, I thought that this parser was supposed to be, uh, you know, I, I thought I, I thought I disambiguated this, right? So there's only one way to parse five plus six, and five plus six plus seven, and so on. Um, so uh, maybe I don't really want a list of expressions here, but an expert. Um, how do I get there? Um, so, it's empty. Um, let's take a maybe expert, right? Because if it's empty, then return nothing. And if it's got one value, then just a. And for whatever else, so if, if it was actually ambiguous, then I'll return nothing. That might not be the best uh, sort of error reporting, right? Because really what's going on here is that you uh, you didn't really disambiguate your grammar enough, and that's one of these things that uh, that simple parse and readp allows you to do. You it allows you to ensure sort of at runtime uh, that uh, your grammar, well, that you actually disambiguated the grammar enough. Um, so uh, let's define a parse uh, parser error as well here, and sort of the parser errors that could be uh, is uh, that we have. We have no parse, right? Uh, or we have uh, ambiguous uh, ambiguity. Let's call that ambiguity. Um, and um, well, that can be a generic type, right? So ambiguity and well, yeah, okay. So list of a ambiguity. And uh, let's export that type. Parse error over into uh, uh, our test module there, and here I'll take either parse error or expr, and in this case I'll say well it's no parse, 
uh, is in this case it's an ambiguity is in this case it's a uh, right so left right Again, um, yeah, thanks. But I don't think that's a problem. Oh, comma. Thank you. Ah. <laughs> wow. Deriving. Um, that's also a problem I'll, I'd run into when I actually try to run my tests, that it wouldn't be uh, interested in doing that. Ooh. Expecting one more argument to parse error. Yes. Okay. So, um, I defined my parse error to, uh, take a, to take a type variable, and I didn't give it a type variable, so here it is. Um, okay, so this is looking better. Uh, I have an R+, plus which I don't use, so let's comment it out. So we don't get that many warnings. Okay. So, plus tests. Okay. So now I get an either uh, error or a value, uh, and uh, um, well, I can compare those because I made uh, I made an instance of equality. Um, so one thing I could do is uh, five. Now, of course, that wouldn't uh, that wouldn't be equals beca because well, it produces two different abstract syntax trees. But when I evaluate those, um, oh, yeah, magic. Um, Okay, so uh, either is also a, an instance of uh, of a functor, and um, so I can use the function fmap to uh, to map a uh, uh, um, well to map a function over an either value, right? So if there actually will be a right value, then this will evaluate, um, and that is how I avoid spurious case expressions. So plus expr y that doesn't make sense. Interpreter interpreter yeah <laughs> uh, okay plus. better yay okay so um, now it's uh, it's complaining that I'm not using quick check and that's true and it's also complaining that I'm not using this AST for anything that is also true thank you yeah still have those warnings about my munch implementation oh well um, so let's try to run those tests uh, I have a main function down here um, and tells me, yay, these are the same. Okay. So uh, that's all nice and dandy, but how about uh, something more, uh, uh, you know, how, how about a slightly more elaborate test? Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, with these values five and six, they're just something that came off the top of my head. Um, and uh, I think we will, uh, we will leave well, we'll we'll start with a with a slightly simpler uh, um, test. Uh, we won't generate a string uh, because that's actually a little bit more complicated. But let's start by generating just an expression, right? So let's test our evalu let's forget about our parser for for, for, for a little while, uh, and let's start by testing our uh, evaluator. Because the evaluator is simple, and we don't have to do things like uh, you know a magic fmap there. Um, so what I would like is a. Uh, I, mean, I don't need to delete everything, but that I'll delete. Okay. Um, so how about if I can uh, if I can generate 
arbitrary expressions, right? Uh, so I, uh, I off the top of my uh, off the top of my head, I generate five plus six. Can I get the computer to do that? Um, that's the purpose of quick check. Um, so uh, uh, it defines a, a nice little uh, type class called arbitrary, which is intended for this sort of thing. So um, I can define an instance um, of arbitrary for my experts. Uh, now I okay. I think I remember. Okay. Um, where? So I can define. Uh, well, I have to define at least one function uh, called arbitrary. Uh, now arbitrary yields arbitrary. Well, it yields an expression. Okay, it's a monad, um, so I can do things. So one of the things that I can do is uh, I can generate an arbitrary number. So here's a number. It's arbitrary. Right. So th the type for now is arbitrary as well until I use n for something, right? Um, so let me just uh, you know let's start with simple expressions. Here they are. Uh, here's one. Right, so now I'm using n as an int, hence the uh, uh, um, type inference uh, built into Haskell will uh, um, realize that the arbitrary that I mean is an arbitrary for de uh, defined for type int, and here's what it will yield. Well, yeah, so 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 so, so it will yield me an arbitrary int, and and ch quick check defines an instance for int, uh, an instance of arbitrary for int. Okay. Um, so uh, so now that means that I can um, write a nice little fancy property where I uh, um, generate a where I can generate values, right? Um, so what could I use that for? Uh, So this wasn't mm. Yeah. So I could do something like um this and you know um I could evaluate E and I could compare it to something, right? But I'm a little bit sort of like okay, so I generate an arbitrary expression, and for now the expression is a little simple. And I have this function eval that can turn an expression into an integer. And what I'd really like to test is whether that integer evaluates to whatever that uh, whatever it is that arbitrary had uh, had done for me. Um, so uh, uh, um, I think we'll. Uh, We'll, we'll leave doing that as an exercise, but the idea is to generate both. So I define a data type here uh, called test case. Um, and uh, that will be, uh, that will have an expert and will have an int, right? And then I make test case an instance of arbitrary. And then I gen generate both an integer. So yeah, so, so for this part, it's actually kind of simple. So arbitrary test case. And what I generate is a con and an and there. Okay. Um, and I also want to wrap that into a test case. Okay. So I might also want to use the record syntax for this, right? So I have the e, well, uh, uh, the case expression. Call it that, and the case value. Call it that. Something like this. Okay. So I'm using the record syntax. Here, and let's also give it a deriving ec shell. Okay. Right. So. Um, now I can generate a test case. So here it is. Here's a test case. 
Um, and I could say, well, okay, so if I take in uh, the case E of my T, right, so if I take the, uh, the expression of my test case and I evaluate that, that should be the same as the uh, case uh, value, uh, the test case value. So let's try to compile that. Um, then scope. That's why I needed that. Um, a little bit of notation and parse error into con. Um Yeah, okay. Record syntax. It's weird. Um So now it runs 100 tests and uh and it and it tests this properly. That sounds um uh, that sounds cool. Um what do those 100 tests look like. Um, so to do that, uh, I haven't quite, so there's a, uh, so you can give these uh, 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 sort of options to when you, uh, when you define your main, uh, instead of default main, you can use a f fancy function which gives you the options, but I think the easier way to do this is to use uh, just uh, run Haskell with the, uh, with the quick check verbose option. Um, so uh, stack exec run Haskell tests which has null and um, quick check verbose oops I'm not using that correctly. Well, okay. Um, it's it's doing uh, it's doing something. <laughs> um, well, I'm using double dash here, right? So um, weird. Um, thought that worked. Test is not No. Um, Yeah, okay. There we go. Thank you. Okay, so it's testing uh uh Yeah, it's testing some crazy values. Um now you can restrict that and uh well, it's 11 o'clock by now, so I won't jump into that. Uh but I will give you uh, a small uh, sl uh a slightly more interesting arbitrary Okay, so um, uh, right. So uh, w w one other, th uh, yeah. So or maybe I won't. Yeah. Keep you back from record testing. Um, yeah. Read the quick check documentation for more interesting uh, combinators. Right. So uh, some com so here uh, here are some examples, sort of just off the top of my head. Uh, that uh, yeah, so you have a, a one-off uh, combinator uh, which uh, can take in um, two uh, uh, arbitrary uh, sort of um, two monadic or two generators, right? Uh, or several. Gener it takes in a list of generators and it gives you one of those. 
So uh, one of the things that we could do here is we could uh, you know, either generate an, uh, a constant int, or we could generate an add, or we could generate a mole if, it's, if we're talking about expr. Um, now, if we, uh, if we just do that, um, uh, then, uh, um, uh, then we run into the problem that at some point, you know, if it's generating sort of random ar ar uh, sort of arbitrary um, uh, expressions, uh, they can be of arbitrary depth. Um, so you'd like to limit the depth uh, of the expressions that you generate. Uh, for that, there is another combinator called sized, which uh, takes in a, uh, an integer and uh, uh, sort of generates a, uh, a value of, of, uh, of that size. Now, size is maintained within the arbitrary uh, uh, sort of monad itself. Uh, and uh, right, so, 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 when you, so when you make something sized, that number comes from the, uh, the monad. Uh, and um, uh, uh, and you generate and, and the idea is that you generate an expression of that size. Now you can change the size as well, right? So you, that you can quickly reduce the size of the expressions that you generate. So let's say that uh, if I if my if I use a one-off, right, and I hit a recursive case where I'm using an add and I need two expressions and I'm using arbitrary to generate those, um, then I want to modify the size to say half the current size. That way, I uh, I reduce and um, sort of the generation of values stops when you when you reach zero, and that's something that you have to handle as well. Um, I think the way I will do that is we'll just hand out an example, and you can take a look at that. Um, yeah. So uh, another thing is that uh, these values that it generates, right? When it actually fails, it can be a little bit uh, hard to see what uh, what what had actually happened. So there's another function called shrink, um, also in a type class here, uh, which has uh, which has sort of a type. In this case, it would be a sort of a test case uh, and to a list of test cases. And the idea is that it's uh, that um, if I have a test case that fails, uh, quick check will attempt to throw it at shrink and see if there are smaller test cases that can test, right? So that's why it returns a list, because if it's something like, uh, okay, the addition fails, well, then try uh, this expression and try this expression, right? So there are, so there are two sub-expressions, smaller sub-expressions that we can try and see if we can come up with a, uh, a counterexample as well. Um, and the idea of shrink is essentially to reduce the sort of noise that you get here, right? So it generates a whole bunch of, uh, you know, it, it generates big values, um, which are uh, not really readable, but are great for testing, right? You wouldn't come up with this off the top of your head, um, uh, but it's hard to see what's going on here. So then you implement shrink to make the, to make quick check actually minimize the failing test case. And um, I think that's where we'll have to stop for today.